guided tour, you will feel that yes, th this is the way, perhaps better way to uh, go through the science center galleries. So, आज जो लोग रहेंगे और of course पर super bug also because uh, as uh, I could see many people have not heard. So there are some volunteers who are there. You can take help from them. They will guide you. They have been trained to take you around there. There are I think five or six people to try to help because slightly a different subject. If you have not heard, it is always better to take a guided tour and then you get orientation. Then you can spend more time to read more or explore. There are computers, there are videos, uh, or you can come again and explore it further. This exhibition will remain here for uh, two months. So today is the 18th and till 16th of February. Post 16th February, those who want to see, they have to visit VITM Bangalore. It, this exhibition will go to Bangalore. Those who will miss it, and if you are going there, you can see this exhibition out there. Yeah, any uh, of you uh, is member of Science Center? Any institution member here? Not, uh, yeah, one, okay. We have some schemes. I'm taking uh, this opportunity uh, to brief you because very rarely we get uh, such time when packed programs are there, but uh, this uh, this uh, membership program, individual residents, they can be member of Science Center. The idea of giving membership is that since the Science Center is having 70 rupees ticket and some other facilities, so if you are coming again and again, if you want to, as I said, one visit is not sufficient, but you are interested to visit and explore further. So you have to pay again and again. But if you are Science Center uh, member, then you need not to pay again. Once you have to pay some amount that you can see on website, once you pay, you will get a card and then you can uh, valid for 12 calendar months, one year, and then you can repeat as many times you want to come. Just show your card, they will give you a zero balance ticket and then you can roam around. But that normally is not, uh, uh, some concession may be there for other shows, but at least exhibits and galleries you can definitely see around. Same is true for membership, uh, school members or institution membership also. If you have a big school, you can take the membership. Then you'll save a lot. So you have to pay maybe some uh, seven, eight thousand rupees for a year. But the entire school, any number of times, they will get free visit. You can come, uh, bring maybe every month, every 15 days, one class without paying any. If you have, say, 4,000, 5,000 or 3,000 strength, then it will be a big opportunity for school. You need not to bother to collect money again and again from the residents. And you can simply plan a visit board in the bus and come to Science Center. It's always better if you intimate us in advance so that we can block the schedule for you and four hours at least, dedicated four hours, our team will take you around showing the film shows, special demonstration shows. So there are packages also for schools. Those who are not having membership, they can avail the package also. That package consists of almost every facility is included in that. So try to uh, utilize all these uh, facilities which we have created and with some incentives for schools, for individuals, uh, for families also and take the benefit of uh, this specially created facilities for school children as well as for public. Many people have a misconception that this is only for schools. This is also a misconception. It's a non-formal. Non-formal is not only for school. School is a formal education center. So, yes, we are supplement. We, we do teach, but we say it's different. Or it is not different, it is differently. We supplement school science education through 3D modeling, uh, interactive exhibits, uh, based on a very famous saying that... Uh, I. Here I forget, I see, I remember, I do, I understand. I think many of, uh, perhaps all of you might have, those who are in particularly, uh, not only in science, maybe in art also it is. When you do something with your own hand, you understand it better. And when you understand, 
देन पर एप्स यू विल रिमेंबर इट ऑल्सो एंड इट्स अ वेरी कॉमन एक्सपीरियंस अभी मैं जो कुछ बोल रहा हूँ हो सकता है आपको उतना याद नहीं रहेगा बट मे बी आफ्टर सम टाइम यू यू विल सी मी समवेयर हो सकता है आपको याद रहे कि ये चेहरा थोड़ा देखा हुआ कहीं ना कहीं कुछ बक बक करते हुए सुना है इनको बट वैन वी विल इंटरेक्ट फर्दर मे बी यू विल रिमेंबर और यू विल अंडरस्टैंड यस वी हैव सीन एट साइंस सेंटर और मे बी इफ वी एक्सप्लेन यू टेक यू अराउंड थ्रू द एग्जिबिट्स पर एफ यू विल रिमेंबर फॉर अ लॉन्ग टाइम एंड वुड लव टू डू दैट if you are willing we can take you around for some time and hour or so we can spend with us and then we'll take you around the exhibits explaining because that is how we can understand the things better so you know maybe short while now from now we'll we are just waiting for the guest Yeah. Guests are just about to arrive. Meanwhile, just one uh, information I have been asked uh, to pass it on to you. On 26, I think 26 December, you know, some event is going to happen. Eclipse, solar eclipse. So in Mumbai also, you will observe that, and we have made special arrangement. Only thing I think uh, it is early morning, so you have to be here. Uh, Uh, we have made some special uh, some there will be some lectures also as well yeah so i think all the guests uh, have arrived yeah please welcome <laughs> professor mm M. sharma सब लोग आए क्या या ऑल ऑफ देम हैव राइट्स आई थिंक we can go ahead with the program okay. Okay. so we have uh, i'll request uh, our director uh, mr chuprasad kanad and director ncsm headquarters uh, shri ash kumar to escort the guest on the dais uh, pro, uh, professor manmohan sharma ji पद्मभूषण डॉक्टर फारूक उदवाडिया मिस्टर क्रिस्पिन साइमन मिस हेलेन जोन्स आई विल रिक्वेस्ट ऑल द गेस्ट टू स्टार्ट द प्रोग्राम डायरेक्टली बाय लाइटिंग द लैम्प एंड आई विल रिक्वेस्ट अवर क्लीग टू फैसिलिटेट दैट लैम्प लाइटिंग दैट द ट्रेडिशनल वे ऑफ ओपनिंग दिस फॉर्मल एग्जीबिशन
Thank you. May I request the dignitaries to take seat on the dais. So as I told you, uh, it's a big day for us, for Nehru Science Center as well as all for people of Mumbai. And to start with uh, this program for this formal inauguration of this exhibition, I'll request as the tradition is to welcome all of you and to all our dignitaries. I'll request our director, Shri Shiv Prashad Kennedy, to welcome all the guests. Good morning. It's indeed a great honor for uh, the Nehru Science Center, the partnering institution, um, London um, Science Museum Group, distinguished colleagues uh, from the Nehru Science Center, NCSM, the partners from uh, UK, uh, students, uh, print and electronic media, and all of this. Um, on behalf of all of you, especially the wonderful children who are sitting here, uh, I would like to welcome our guests today with uh, uh, a small flower bouquet. May I, at the outset, uh, request Ansela Dalmet from the Gokhale, Gokhale College of Education to formally welcome uh, Professor M.M. Sharma with the uh, flower bouquet. Uh, Flower bouquet. May I request Cheryl Demel from uh, Gokhale College of Education to formally welcome uh, Dr. Budwadia, sir. May I request Shifa Faruqi from SIWS College, Wadala, to formally welcome uh, Ms. Helen, Helen Jones. She's the Director of Global Engagement and Strategy. Okay. Uh, last but not the least, uh, Mr. Crispin Simon, the British uh, Deputy High Commissioner for Western India. May I request uh, Pramila Dabade from the Advocate Bapu Sahib Bonde High School, Lonawala. Uh, this exhibition, Superbugs, is it the end of antibiotics? Uh, is a collaborative uh, exhibition between uh, the National Council of Science Museum, the Science Museum groups uh, in India, and uh, the London Science Museum group. It's been co-curated to ensure that it's, uh, it has got an India-centric uh, component in this. Um, all of us know for sure that uh, the wonder drug uh, uh, antibiotics, you know, the penicillin from the serendipitous uh, discovery point of, from that point of time when Alexander Fleming in that famous, on that famous day of 28th September, he serendipitously came across some, um, he, he saw in his petri dish uh, kind of a um, fungal thing which was actually destroying uh, uh, the microbes the bacteria. From that point till now, we have come a long way. The antibiotics have uh, saved millions and millions of lives. But then we are now at a stage where uh, these very antibiotics, which were a great boon of uh, scientific and technological uh, uh, discoveries and inventions, uh, of course, with uh, hundreds and thousands of people who have worked beyond the screens, behind the screen. We only know about uh, Alexander Fleming and the other two who got the Nobel Prize, but then there are a number of engineers and applied science people, and it has been a collaborative effort between uh, several countries, particularly um, England and US, or the Pfizer company, for example, where the, the deep fermentation process, Margaret Hutchinson, who perhaps most of us have forgotten. Now, several people have worked in uh, finding out this, uh, discovering or inventing this uh, wonder drug. But over time, because of uh, underuse, overuse, these very bacteria, these very pathogens uh, have tended to become resistant, and that's where we have the issues of uh, antimicrobial resistance. The government of India, like uh, the World Health Organization, who wanted a global action on uh, how do we combat this, we, government of India also has passed several legislations, including the one latest in 2017, where we are talking about uh, the national uh, uh, mission for uh, combating this antimicrobial resistance. I'm sure uh, at the very look at the exhibition, which I'm sure over the days, many of the school students will come in large numbers to have a look at that. You'll be the brand ambassador. The first strategy is to create an awareness on uh, uh, 
um, what AMR is all about, especially those, those of these microbes which have gone on to become the, the superbugs. So I'm sure you'll learn about that, and hopefully some of you could perhaps become uh, Dr. Gudwadias and Professor M.M. Sharma's to bring in, you know, to bring the benefits of science to, uh, uh, to the society. With these few words, once again, on behalf of the, the collaborating institutions, I welcome you all for the opening of the Superbugs exhibition. Thank you. Thank you, sir, uh, for this orientation and welcome. As you can, as sir has already told, uh, one of the uh, collaborator, you can say, Science Museum group, and uh, we have with us uh, Miss Helen Jones, who is Director, Global Engagement and Strategy Science Museum Group, UK. I'll request her to say few words on this. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. And good morning, everybody, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, friends and partners. So, as Mr. Kennard acknowledged, and as is so often the case, uh, it's me standing here this morning, but I'm doing so on behalf of a great many colleagues from the Science Museum in London and others who've helped to make this all happen. Some of you have already met the brains behind the operation, our curator Sheldon Paquin, who's here um, today. Um, but I also include our major funder, the Wellcome, Collection, the Wellcome Trust, which is a wonderful long-standing partner of the Science Museum Group and of science education around the world. And the British Council as well, who were in at the beginning of this project, funding the initial research phase and who are also represented here today. Of course, huge thanks to the National Council of Science Museums in India who have done such a fantastic job of translating the exhibition to the Indian context and extending it to tell new stories because it's much bigger here than it was in London. As well as India, Superbugs has already been shown in China, uh, uh, Russia, Argentina, South Korea, and a mini version was shown at a United Nations event in New York. Throughout its tour, it will be seen by literally millions of people adapted by the hosts to make its messages relevant and engaging to local audiences. And that's important because this is an exhibition with a message. So antimicrobial resistance is a global issue and it demands a global response, not only through the collaborative research that gives us hope for the future, but through the decisions and behaviors of individuals, people like you and me, this is true of other issues too, of course, as highlighted by the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals and with the climate emergency at, at the forefront of many minds. But there's very much more for science museums to do. Science, as we've said, is a global endeavor and culture can also transcend national boundaries. They're combined in the Science Museum Group's mission to inspire futures. And we're thrilled and very proud to be working with such great partners to fulfill a part of this mission in India. So thank you to the NSCM for this opportunity to share and to learn with you. And I hope that you all and the many visitors to the Nehru Science Centre over the next few months will enjoy the exhibition and all the wonderful events that are planned around it and maybe learn a little bit too. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Jones. So you have come to know that already this exhibition, actually, uh, exhibition itself is not the same it has, as it's a global issue. Uh, now uh, I will request um, Mr. Crispin Simon, who is British Deputy High Commissioner for Western India, to come on the dais and say a few words. Well, thank you very much indeed for this nice invitation to be here today uh, in front of a wonderfully engaged audience. Um, good morning to you all and uh, a great honor to be on the same stage as Professor Sharma and Dr. Urwadia. Uh, and I feel in a dangerous position here. I'm keeping you uh, and I stand between you and these distinguished scientists. Um, so I won't detain you for long. Uh, I'm not a distinguished scientist. I'm not even a scientist. Um, but I am wearing a tie um, that displays the structure of DNA, um, which is as near as I'm going to get to being a scientist. 
Um, I bought it from a website um, called um, uh, Infectious Awareables to help people be aware. Uh, and I have another tie, which is rather attractive, with um, little purple lozenges on it, uh, which is um, the structure of a C. difficile under a microscope. But I felt under the circumstances, um, people might feel I was rather missing the point of the exhibition if I was to wear that tie. Um, but I also, in my role as wearer of a, a science tie uh, and a champion of science uh, in my role here in the diplomatic mission in Mumbai, uh, was particularly pleased to hear the recognition that was given to Margaret Hutchinson uh, in the role of the discovery of penicillin, um, echoing in relation to this tie the role of Dr. Franklin uh, in the discovery of the structure of DNA. Both of these women, um, in the case of Dr. Franklin, not properly recognized at all in her lifetime. Uh, and with so many women and girls in the audience, uh, I think it's important to recognize right back through time the role of women in the uh, <coughs> evolution of these important scientific discoveries. Um, and I hope we have Nobel laureates uh, of either gender, both genders, in the audience here today. Um, it's a pleasure also to be on the dice with Helen Jones, who we've just heard from, uh, and I'm tremendously grateful to the Science Museum for bringing um, this thrilling exhibition, um, and also, of course, to Mr. Kenned and Mr. Kumar. The work that we have here in the British High Commission in India uh, across uh, our 10 cities um, is part of what we characterize as the living bridge, the bridge that exists between, uh, that starts here in Mumbai, goes across many countries with which both countries are perfectly friendly, um, but lands, we feel, in the UK. And over that bridge um, cross many uh, ideas, values, family relationships, personal interests, cricket, I'm afraid it always has to be on the list, um, these things that hold us together. Um, but I think that this kind of work in the field of antimicrobial resistance, raising awareness and collaborative programs to address the scientific challenges are particularly exciting. Um, and we have a series of programs to address the challenges that are truly global where discoveries that are made here in India by scientists are extremely relevant to the challenges that we have back in the UK. And researchers, both in the social sciences uh, and in the natural sciences, are able to collaborate uh, on solving problems that face both our countries. And I had the pleasure and privilege of being at IIT Bombay yesterday to listen to a, a, a team of social researchers who were looking at domestic violence against women, mental health for children, uh, and access to healthcare for the disadvantaged in collaboration with um, Queen Mary College London. Uh, so both in the social sciences and in the natural sciences, we see this important collaboration um, supporting uh, and representing the living bridge that I find so exciting as my role here as a diplomat here in Mumbai. So um, congratulations to the government of India on the banning of colostin for non-human use. Uh, congratulations on the development of the surveillance systems um, that gather the data that will help us um, combat antimicrobial resistance that are just as important back in the UK. Colla uh, thank you and, colla uh, and congratulations um, for the collaboration that exists between UK RI, uh, Research and Innovation, uh, and the Department of Biotechnology in India. Um, and the support that DBT has provided to the UK's Longitude Prize, uh, which is given every, so, every few years to attack a problem of fundamental scientific um, difficulty uh, and importance. And out of the 60 teams that were shortlisted for the Longitude Prize, in a call that went worldwide, 18 have come from India, uh, which is a very, very high proportion. Uh, and I'm proud to see that, I'm proud to see uh, of the collaboration that um, that speaks to. So thank you for your attendance and support here today, for your commitment to uh, this particular challenge and our wider collaborations. Um, I'm going to go back to the Superbugs exhibition. I spent 20 minutes there earlier today. It wasn't nearly long enough. I'm going to go back. I hope you do too and bring your friends and save the world. Thank you.
Thank you, sir. Uh, now I invite, uh, since uh, as sir has told uh, about superbugs and the kind of problem, I think it is fitness of thing that we have with us. A man, perhaps all of you are aware about him in Mumbai, Dr. Farooq Udwarya ji. It's about superbugs, so I think. Uh, eminent, very eminent physician, perhaps all of you know him. Please welcome him for the address. Dr. Farooq Udwad. Good morning, everyone. Uh, distinguished members of the dais, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, after the discovery of penicillin by Alexander Fleming, amazingly it was Alexander Fleming who first pointed out that if this antibiotic is used indiscriminately, almost certainly, not almost certainly, but certainly the bacterium. And here he was talking of the Staphylococcus and gram-positive organisms. They were all going to be resistant. And that would be an unfortunate event. And this is exactly as it turned out. You'd be surprised that amazingly, around the middle of 1970 or sometime in the early 70s, the uh, Infectious Disease Association of the United States made a very remarkable statement, saying that for all practical purposes, we have conquered infectious diseases. How wrong they were. In fact, soon after that, it was the infectious diseases that conquered us. Antibiotic resistance, unfortunately, is a global problem. It perhaps affects our country even more because of the large population, health services which are not quite all right, the absence of regulations in prescribing antibiotics, not just in the lay public, but in hospitals and in such places, makes the problem even more difficult to solve. Epidemiological studies have shown that the consumption of antibiotics is in direct relationship to the emergence and spread of resistant bacteria. So we have no doubt about the importance of that statement. Now, I'd like to ask why do bacteria become resistant to antibiotics? It's rather simple. They follow the, the, the principles outlined in Darwin's theory of evolution. If exposed to antibiotics for a long time, they adjust and they become resistant. And there are two ways in which this happens. One, the sensitive bacteria are killed, but a core, a small core of the resistant antibacteria remain and multiply and become more and more resistant. That's the theory of natural selection, the same with Charles Darwin stated in relation to the evolution of all life in this world. And there are there, of course, is the genetic change. It's the survival of the fittest. The antibiotics have been with us for more than three and a half billion years. They have been evolving for three and a half billion years, many, many, many more years before Homo sapiens came on the scene. So they're going to adapt. This is one way in which they adapt. The other way, of course, is a genetic change. There is a change in the gene which makes sure that the property of the bacterium is such that it can resist the antibiotic. There are various ways it can do that. Changes in the cell wall, changes in which way the metabolism of the, of the bacterium works so that it rejects the antibiotic, or destroys the antibiotic, or does not allow the antibiotic to spread. And there's another way also, this is called the horizontal gene transfer, whereby genes which are resistant from one bacterium go on, can be transferred to a completely total bacterial strain. So you can see how nature takes care and makes sure that the bacterium are not easily destroyed. It's really a question of survival of the fittest, which is so. With humankind and with all living matters, it is so also for the bacteria. 
it sees, you see how dangerous it is to alter significantly the ecosystem around humankind. Now, having said that, what is meant by the improper use of antibiotics? So that is what has led to antibiotic resistance. Improper use, and I think it's important for the lay people particularly to know that, is one, using antibiotics when they are absolutely not indicated, for example, in the absence of an infection. You have conditions which can produce fever and changes which are resembling infection, but which are not due to an infectious disease, viral infections. That's one major misuse, I think, in this part of the world at least, for of antibiotics. The third is using it for a bacterial in infection, but not choosing the right antibiotic. The next, you choose the antibiotic, but you don't deliver it appropriately. In the right dosage, in the right method, not giving it the optimal dosage level in the bloodstream. So these are ways in which improper use of antibiotics can easily take place. Now, the thing is, how do you prevent that? I think the most important thing is to try and reverse the improper use that we have. Let's take hospitals first. It's extremely important to have antibiotic stewardship. What is meant by that? You need to have a surveillance in a particular unit, particularly high-risk units in a hospital, as to what is the bacterial flora present. It varies from hospital to hospital, and certainly from one part of this country to another. Once you've identified that, once you've identified that, you need to compute its resistance the usual antibiotics. And that requires a really good microbiological lab. And once you have done that and seen which organisms are most susceptible to which antibiotics, you make an antibiogram so that you know which antibiotic is to be given for a particular infection. But then again, you need the facilities to be able to identify the infection, to identify the bacterium which is causing that infection. And that, unfortunately, in our part of the world is not easy. Facilities are not great, and except for large laboratories and large hospitals which have good micro labs, you might find this difficult to do in places which are small, with small hospitals, and particularly outside large cities. Once you have done that, this is called a surveillance. Once you have done that, you plan your antibiogram. But the question is to implement the antibiogram is not easy. Even in hospitals, even in large hospitals. For one thing, unfortunately, doctors have large egos. And if you tell them, or if it is made out, that this is what you should use, this is the program for a particular infection. You said, this is my patient, you know, I think, I think I know best. I know my patient best. I'm not going to use this, I'm going to use this. So there must be some way in which the prescription of an antibiogram or a prescription of an antibiotic, at least in hospitals, is made almost compulsory in situations. This is not easy, but it is to some extent possible. Then your antibiotic program or stewardship should be monitored. Should be imposed, it should be monitored. And it should be evaluated with progressive treatment of a particular illness. These are important points, and only then, at least in hospitals, you can have some discipline in the prescription of antibiotics. Now, who does all of this? In my hospital, in the unit where I work, in the critical care unit where I work, we have a particular committee called the Infection Control Committee. It does the surveillance, of course, not by itself. You have the doctor, the doctor in charge, the sister in charge, a couple of nurses, a couple of other people within the hospital who monitors infection, produces an antibiogram, the microbiologist in particular is the most important person concerned, and tries to see if they can recognize infection quickly and if they can control infection. 
Controlling of infection by the infection control committee is, is extremely, extremely important. And what we aim and what all should aim is to get down our infection rates. We call them nosocomial infections because they are within the hospital to as low as possible. It's important, impossible to get them down to a zero level, but to get them down as low as is possible. And this infection control committee, mind you, should be there all the time vigilant. And as probably most of you know, hand washing is the single most important preventive measure in passing infection from one patient to the other. And also isolating patients who are badly infected is another important way in which you can control infection. So this is, these are all important points. Now, when you consider the lay public outside hospital, it's almost an impossibly difficult situation in the city of Bombay. For the simple reason that the antibiotics are prescribed left, right, and center by medical practitioners. For the simple reason that they're available off the counter all the time. You can go and ask the pharmacist, I want this particular antibiotic, and he almost certainly will dispense it. This has to change. It's difficult to change that. There has to be, of course, a certain amount of awareness and education. Awareness amongst the lay people how dangerous it is to consume antibiotics without reason and without a prescription from a doctor. Awareness of the pharmacist in pharmaceutical, in, in pharmacies to remember that it is wrong to prescribe or to rather uh, dispense antibiotics without a prescription. Can this be enforced? I don't know. I think it's a matter of administrative, uh, administrative difficulties, but uh, somehow or the other, it has to be done. Otherwise, the spread of antibiotic resistance is not going to be reduced. It's important to realize that resistance to antibiotics arising from hospitals and high-risk areas within the hospital spread not only to the wards, but also to the outside community. So now we have individuals who have severe antibiotic re resistance to very powerful antibiotics, even coming out from the community, which is a disaster, really. So we have really a tremendous global problem, and as I said, even greater problem in our part of the world. There are other ways in which you know antibiotics can be misused or are being used and giving rise to antibiotic resistance, eating, for example, poultry particularly, or all meats, you know, where they are injected with antibiotics to increase their yield, and that, and they become resistant to the bugs that are, the antibiotics are there, and they become resistant to bugs there, and these antibiotic resistant bugs are then transferred to human beings. And also these animals, for example, pass most of their antibiotics out into their urine and feces. They contaminate the ecosystem and that again is another source of antibiotic resistance. So there are many ways in which this happens. Now I think I need to know the, at least a brief idea on what these antibiotics are. They're largely gram-negative organisms. In high-risk units you have the E. coli, you have the Acinetobacter, you have the Klebsiella, and you have the Pseudomonas. These are the great nasty organisms. You won't believe it, till recently, these nasty bugs which are death-giving were at least sensitive to the carbapenems, a group of higher antibiotics, but they've become resistant to them. And the incidence is quite high. 50 to 60 percent of gram-negative organisms are now resistant to carbapenems. And then you have the last resort, the cholestins and the polymyxin. And of course there are individuals now where the bug is resistant even to cholestin and the poly. That's the last resort we have. So you have the emergence of multi-drug resistance or ex-drug, complete drug resistance to uh, antibiotics and the patient invariably dies. And you can imagine, because these infections spread, they spread horizontally, they spread in the unit, they spread through the clothes, to the surrounding environment, they are spread from there to the wards, and from the wards they go outside. So you can imagine the disaster that looms ahead of us 
in due course of time. Maybe it's not as great as the climate crisis, but it is indeed verging towards a great crisis in due course of time. It's worth remembering that today about 700,000 people worldwide die of infection produced by resistant, to infections related to resistant antibiotics. And it's computed perhaps by another three decades or so. 10 million people in the world will be dying of such infections which are resistant to antibiotics. So it's worth remembering how important it is. So the proper use of antibiotics, regulated use of antibiotics, and there are numerous ways in which this regulation can be brought about. A great awareness of the importance of the problem. Education, extremely important also. And perhaps newer antibiotics, nothing in the pipeline of importance so far. That makes the problem even more dangerous. And finally, is it possible to look at, look at uh, possibilities of therapy outside antibiotics? That's the other way of looking at it. To my mind, at the moment, there's nothing really tangible that has come out of this. So that's why, ladies and gentlemen, we face a grave crisis. And to the young people here particularly, I do think we should look at this museum, for that's what this, uh, uh, this exhibition is all about, creating an awareness and educating people, young people particularly, how important it is to tell the doctor that am I really deserving of an antibiotic? So yes, I will take it. And number two, not to take antibiotics off the counter, just for the heck of it, because you've got a fever, because the fever may not be related to the bacterial infection itself. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Duwadia. I think now, in a very small speech, perhaps you have been made aware about the causes, concerns, challenges, and in a way, what the way forward is, how we can. So about this exhibition, now I think all of you must be excited uh, after listening in. Now, we have come out with a small uh, booklet and brochures also about the exhibition. I'll request the dignities uh, to release these booklets and brochures. These are the information which you people have after visiting the exhibition. Now, uh, we come, uh, I would like to invite uh, Padam Bhushan, Professor Manmohan Sharmaji, Amitas Professor of Eminence of Institute of Chemical Technology, a guy, Padam Vibhushan, and uh, a guiding force for all of us. Yeah, yeah that's me. A guiding force for all us, all of us at Science Center, I think Professor M. M. Sharma. We normally, we popularly call Professor M. M. Sharma. <laughs> I'll re request him to come and say, we give the inaugural address, Professor M. M. Sharma. Distinguished colleagues uh, on the dais, most specifically our most respected, most outstanding physician, Dr. Farooq Udwadia, I had the privilege of sharing Padma Bhushan 1987 with him. So we have uh, this kind of a long uh, association. The, I think Dr. Udwadia has really, in a very succinct way, indicated all the problems associated with antibiotics. I am a chemical engineer. I am involved in the manufacture of uh, these, some of these antibiotics uh, and some other drugs with pharmaceutical company. And you know, the journey from sulfur drugs 
to the most modern carbapenems and others. But every uh, drug, for example, if you take, since TB is talked about more frequently, and 25% of the global patients are in India, TB takes the center stage. And even in the case of rifampicin, rifapentine, and other modifications have come in. But as you were told, bugs are smarter. They get over them even. But there is a contrast of this, and since there was a reference made uh, by the Deputy High Commissioner about lady scientists, I want to give you the example of Francis Arnold, who last year got the Nobel Prize on directed evolution. On one side, they are bad. On the other side, the super bugs are fantastic, because you do directed evolution, and you are able to carry out fermentation to make molecules which even nature couldn't make. So you have a contrasting situation that you do microbiology, come out with something which is truly outstanding. On the other hand, they are so damaging. But I want to, to say something else. You all know, with reference to TB, that when BCG came, it was considered as a major breakthrough. So making of vaccines, in some areas India has a dominant position in the world, but vaccines, BCG doesn't work. Dr. Udwadia, I think, is only just kind of a formality that given the childhood, perhaps it helped. I had association with ARS Global TB vaccine, which uh, thing in the United States, very strongly supported uh, Bill and uh, Melinda, Melinda Gates uh, Foundation. And even uh, modified BCG hasn't worked. You can see for yourself how difficult, if you want to eradicate, vaccines are the answer. How vaccines have done such wonderful work for so many diseases. If you want a panacea, one should go for vaccines. They are not easy. They are one of the highest endeavors in science, because many times politicians have habit of asking what scientists have done. I say scientists have done something which you are carrying in your pocket all the time. They they were ubiquitous mobile phone, you know, as all gift of, of, of scientists. And that serendipity has played a role. You have been repeatedly told that uh, penicillin was serendipitous, accidental discovery. But accidents have never occurred to uninitiated persons. They always occur only to. So I want to, first of all, emphasize about uh, development of vaccines. It's a very tough job. But I still feel, in the case of TB, if one is able to get a vaccine which is really effective, I think we'll be able to contain this courage. Now, unfortunately, what has happened in India, the market forces are such, now I'm speaking more as a chemical engineer, would, many of you won't know, there's no manufacture of penicillin in India. Penicillin VOG, Hindustan antibiotics started in 50s. Our entire cephalosporins, are dependent on import of penicillin V and G. We are highly vulnerable. Cephaclo, cephalexin, none of them gram positive, gram negative, none of them will be available in the market if for some reason penicillin V and G didn't come to India. So we are making ourselves more and more vulnerable. Uh, on the other hand, nothing to do with uh, superbugs, but even in the case of diabetes, metformin is critically dependent upon an intermediate that comes from China. And you would have heard recently how PMO is talking about reducing the dependence on, on China. It's one thing to talk, another thing to act. So you were repeatedly told by Dr. Udwadia that the abuse of antibiotics is so much. You go with the common cold and the GP gives you anti-allergic, antibiotic and what not. So, you know, combination of you are, you are taking something like 12, 10, 12 pills a day just to take care of viral infection. But so much is talked about um, TB, but there are other infections. I like to refer to one or two, which I have found very difficult to deal with. Uh, you all know nowadays that you have any infection, you have to first get a list of your resistance to different antibiotics which wasn't the case many years ago. Are you resistant to this? And you'll find many times 
more than 60 or 70 percent of the antibiotics, <laughs> they don't work on you. And they vary from person to person. It's so bad as that. So this business of uh, coming out with antibiotics, and pharma companies find it's far more profitable to work on cancer drugs because they are very expensive and the returns are very high. The only time some drug, not cancer, but hepatitis C, when Gilead came out, it was the real panacea for uh, hepatitis C uh, uh, patients. Uh, and fortunately, they made a concession for India that you could make it in a very cheap way. So foreigners were coming to India to get treated for, for hepatitis C. But I want to make a reference to urinary tract infection particularly amongst women. And they become resistant to antibiotics, first to the oral antibiotics, and then because it has to be given intravenous, you have to get admitted in hospital. It has become a very serious problem, and I find from the list of antibiotics that are being developed, I find UTI is finding a prominent place, and people are coming out with the combo, combo drugs. Dr. Udvadia made a reference to carbapenem, and that they are combination drugs which are being. But I don't think that battle has been won. I'm not competent to make a comment, but from some experience I have, I find that uh, we are, first of all, we are not able to get the, the reason why it is so. When you ask the neurologist or doctor, why is one person getting this urinary tract infection? You're not able to get a satisfactory answer. And you are stuck. The fever goes very high, 104, 105. And you have to be immediately admitted into hospital. I think we should really work in this direction, particularly for women, for UTI. And I would urge our doctor friends to, or researchers to look, uh, look into, into, into this, this area. So it is it's, it's a very different world. First is the hard job of coming out, discovery of a new molecule. So far, in spite of a lot of money being spent on research by pharmaceutical companies, it is a bit disappointing that we have not come out with a single new drug. We did come out with some candidate drugs that fell apart in phase two and in phase three also. And one of the record is even in the case of antibiotics, one in five falls apart, it doesn't see the day. So it's a, it's, a, it's a very difficult, when coming to diagnostics, mycobacterial diseases as is referred to. Now, if you are not a pulmonary or tuber, even today, the diagnostic part for TB is found wanting. Some improvements have taken place. Now, if your diagnostic is not right on a prophylactic basis, you are being administered that high severity drugs, four drugs, five drugs for six months in a year, I think it's really brutal. So one is looking for some solution. I still feel getting a vaccine might do a major part of the job. I do want to compliment the Science Museum and the British uh, Science Museum that they have collaborated to create this uh, awareness and this excellent exhibition adapted for Indian uh, uh, atmosphere <laughs> or Indian scene, I think is very good. I want to compliment you openly and heartily that uh, this, uh, this awareness, because most people do not know and they merrily chew like a lollipop antibiotics. <laughs> and it's, 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 a, it's a very dangerous thing, you know. And you know, the, the, the patient feels happy that the, the GP has given me everything that matters, you know. And as Dr. Udwadi has very strongly emphasized, that unless you track the need for antibiotic and you administer antibiotic, and against all law, the law is there in India. It's a question of implementation of law. It does say that you cannot buy these antibiotics without prescription. And it says on the drug, it's available only on prescription. And yet, you can get it for asking. I think that has to stop. How can that machinery be improved is left to the able administrators of, uh, of India. And of course, awareness. I think I would lay the onus also on all of us that we need to be also vigilant and not ask for an antibiotic without taking a 
proper prescription from a, from a doctor. Once again, I thank you for inviting me. I am, I, I recognize that I am not a person with medical background, but I do have some experience of manufacture of antibiotics and drugs. Thank you. Uh, it's time to felicitate or rather make it slightly memorable to all our dignitaries. I will request uh, our uh, director, Shri Shivabhashat Kennedy, to give a memento to Padam Vibhushan, Professor M.M. M. Sharma, today's chief guest. <clears throat> I'll again uh, request him to present one to Dr. Uh, Padam Bhushan, Dr. Farooq Udwadiya ji also. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Up. I'll request here uh, Sri Shamarendra Kumar, Director NCSM Headquarter, to present one to Mr. Crispin Simon. And once again, uh, request him to present one to Miss Helen Jones also. Uh, and now, uh, as you know, any event or managers, you have to take help and uh, guidance and include so many people behind the scene. I'll request Director NCSM Headquarters, Shri Shamrendra Kumar, who is also my, part of the team leader of this exhibition, uh, to come and propose a word of thanks. So, good afternoon and namaskar. Uh, respected dignity sitting on the dais, our most valued invited guests, Ladies and gentlemen, young scientists, researchers, and students present here in the audience, colleagues from NCSM and friends from the media. It's really my privilege to propose a vote of thanks on this uh, momentous occasion. I, on behalf of the National Council of Science Museums and Aeroscience in Mumbai, extend a very hearty thanks to our chief guest, Padmavishan, Dr. M.M. Sharmaji, the eminent professor of eminence at the uh, Institute of Chemical Technology, Mumbai, for sparing his valuable time to inaugurate this exhibition and also deliver the inaugural address. So your kind words are inspiring to all of us and uh, we are blessed with your presence here, sir, today. I would also like to thank uh, with gratitude uh, Padmushan, Dr. Farooq Yudwadiyaji, an eminent physician for antibiotics and how to use it intimately has inspired and motivated us. As a professional, you are an inspiration for a, a lot of young boys and girls present here and uh, I hope that many of you will take up this noble profession like him. I would like to express my gratitude to Mr. Crispin Simon, the British Deputy High Commissioner uh, of Western India, for joining us today in this uh, launch event. Your presence here will further uh, strengthen the collaboration between National Council of Science Museums and Science Museum Group uh, for new projects of mutual interest. I would also like to thank the British Council for the support and the hope that the bond will continue further. I would like to thank uh, Ms. Helen J Jones, Director of Global Engagement and Strategy Science Museum Group London for coming to India and join this inaugural event. Uh, the collaboration with Science Museum Group has been extremely satisfying and productive for the design and development of this exhibition. And I would all like to thank uh, Mr. Sheldon Paquin here uh, from the Science Museum London Group who was the uh, uh, curator for this exhibition in the London for his constant support and feedback and continuously talking on phone, emails, and like that for developing this exhibition. And we again uh, thank once again to SMG for this partnership with NCSM and hope the bond strengthens and continue for new projects in the future. Uh, I would also like to thank Sri SM Kenner, Director of Neuroscience Center Mumbai, for his presence here, kind presence here, and hosting this exhibition uh, in Mumbai. His entire team of staff needs a big round of applause for the perfect logistic support for hosting here uh, this event and installing this exhibition in a very short time because uh, it's a, it's a one-year exhibition. We started in the, uh, Delhi and uh, we have in a fixed time we have to go and from here this exhibition goes to uh, Bangalore after two months stint here. 
So I thank all the staff members who have done great work for this. The center has already planned a number of exciting events during this two months to create awareness on the issue and hope that thousands of people will participate in this, uh, all these events. Uh, I would also like to thank uh, our Director General, Mr. A.D. Chaudhary, who could not make to this event today, but as he has conveyed his uh, sincere uh, wishes for the success of this exhibition. Uh, I would also like to especially thank uh, Welcome Trust UK for uh, supporting this exhibition, and without which this exhibition at such a large scale would not have been possible. Uh, we hope that the exhibition and activities planned with this exhibition will meet its objective in creating public awareness amongst a large cross-section of population on AMR uh, and uh, antibiotic resistance especially. Uh, I would also like to thank ICMR, the Indian Council of Medical Research, and, uh, and a host of institutions, uh, the, the Department of Biotechnology, ICR, and several other institutions and individuals for their valuable support in content development and providing artifacts for this exhibition. Uh, I would like to thank the doctors, professionals, scientists, researchers, farmers, and associations who have contributed directly and indirectly for this exhibition. A special gratitude to the in individuals who have been showcased in the human section. Their stories are inspiring and thought-provoking. We hope viewers will appreciate uh, their contributions in the exhibition. I also extend my thanks to all the media, print, electronics, social, and the persons present here, and hope that they would cover the event so as to reach out to a large section of people. At the end, I would like to thank everyone connected with this exhibition, whom I may have missed out also, for their valuable contribution to the exhibition. Uh, this exhibition is here up to uh, a 17th of, uh, 16th of Feb February 2020, and I hope you will enjoy this exhibition. Please visit the exhibition and uh, go back with a very sound memories and, and the message of this exhibition. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'll request all the residents to remain seated for maybe a couple of more minutes and all the dignitaries to join and invitees to join for a cup of tea in conference room. And all the press, that's, uh, immediately after that we'll have the press conference okay. in conference room. Back. I'll request all others to remain seated and yeah, you please join us. Yeah. All the students, uh, <coughs> they need to collect their refreshment pack, a small. I'll request all others, maybe, uh, I think they, uh, this school from Lonawala, I think, they need to go a bit early, so yeah, please, you can just, uh, Inka, um, Shaili, just uh, take them and uh, give the refreshment pack and then Inko baat hoogi, you don't know, kaha pere kare ke? Refreshment pack.
थैंक यू फॉर योर पेशेंस एंड बाकी लोग इधर से तो इनको इधर से दो कलेक्ट ग्रुप में लेना है या एक अलग अलग